Libby Sellers. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is my first time to Hasselt, so I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, last year, as we were just saying, saw the centenary celebrations of in, in the UK, certainly, and this year in, in the States and across Europe generally, uh, saw the 100th anniversary of some women winning the right to vote, uh, and also the right to be voted for election. It was uh, a year that saw, last year, the 100th anniversary, was a year that saw a plethora of events and exhibitions and publications. This 100th year an anniversary saw a you know, number of events, exhibitions and publications, mine included, uh, which all looked to celebrate the many achievements that women have made in this 100, uh, 100 years since they'd won the right to vote. But without fail, all of these exhibitions, events and publications were also a chance to lament just how far we still have to go before we reach equality within certainly the design industry, but within life in general. At the time which I was writing the book, uh, and for those of you who, who don't know it, as it says there, it is about architecture, product, graphic, industrial, and also textile design, I had to face a couple of personal demons. In an era when the conversation really should be about gender neutrality, uh, and that public consciousness is starting to move towards that, it would be nice to think that such gender-specific publications don't need to exist. Uh, but as painful as it is to admit, one of my biggest misgivings about design culture is that it is so patriarchal, that it always has been and unfortunately continues to be so now. In this post-Weinstein contemporary society, we might think that women's voices are echoing around the world right now through the international women's marches, the Time's Up campaign, and hashtag Me Too. Yet in design publications, in conferences, in judging panels, and other public realms, with the exception of tonight, women designers, women practitioners, women speakers tend to be outnumbered by their male counterparts. As we heard earlier, women Designers tend to make up nearly three quarters of the student application process in, in Europe and North America, yet this figure drops dramatically to less than one quarter when it comes to senior figures in the industry itself. And then uh, industry studies are now, as we're, sorry, it's not responding to me. So, <laughs> very happy for somebody else to... Sorry, technical hitch. Sorted out by a man. <laughs> <laughs> Poor little me. In this post-Weinstein contemporary society, when, when women's voices are echoing around the world right now, uh, we would think that uh, you know, we should have more power, but we, we don't have that voice. And uh, certainly the statistics for students are, are showing that they're, they're not being given uh, the opportunity in senior level figures. And then also in the industry, we're starting to see through all the announcements of um, the requirement to declare the uh, pay that is divided between the genders, we're starting to see gender pay gaps, problems relating to inflexible work hours. Okay, I have to do it like that. And, uh, sorry, we should be at that one by now. <laughs> Uh, widespread microaggressions and also the silent stereotyping that we were hearing about earlier, but the consequences of which not only a, a disproportionate number of women in senior level figures, but also the inevitable effect that this has on the industry and our, the, our reading of the industry and the quality of the industry. And I think that's the most important part to make the uh, point to make tonight. Design is obviously not unique in this gender bias, though this disparity is particularly at odds in an industry that is predicated on the ideals of progressive, uh, you know, forward-thinking um, ideas and democratic, democratic ideals. However, as the concept of design, the design as we know it today, proper commercial design, uh, how at, that came to maturity in the 20th century, and as such, it inherited that century's 
uh, prejudices and conventions. And this is what we're working against today. Unfortunately, the impact of that has been to marginalize, relegate, disregard, and suppress women's large, large contributions to it. So, if we were to skip straight to an, an acceptance of gender neutrality, we would risk ignoring the knock-on gender bias that persists within the industry. Those who rightly believe that gender should not matter and that talent and merit alone should be the, uh, the determinant as to who succeeds must also acknowledge that these latent prejudices that exist in the profession have already eliminated or repressed an overwhelming majority of that same talent pool. So to continue without realigning the balance, something I hope I have tried to achieve through the publication, uh, will only result in an impoverished future for design as a result. For tonight's talk though, I decided not to focus on the missing heroines of fashion, fashion of the fashion industry, or to list the many ways in which the contemporary fashion industry suffers from a male bias. Not least as I imagine this has already been very eloquently done in the exhibition Wonder Women. Uh, but in light of my fellow speakers, and by way of positioning and historical <coughs> overview, I thought it might be more appropriate to focus on what has become known as the subversive stitch. Examples of how in the 20th century, textile and thread have been used to help challenge accepted norms about gender, but also about politics, society, and the arts in general. As I've already mentioned the suffragettes, they seem a very good place to start. The crux of the suffragette design strategy was this brilliant color coding system devised by Sylvia Pankhurst, who was the daughter of Emmeline Pankhurst and sister of Christabel. And they were the leaders of what was known as the Women's Social and Political Union, or WSPU. When Sylvia was asked to devise a strategy that would, could be used at a rally in Hyde Park in London in June 1908, she strove to find a way of maximizing its visual impact that would be versatile enough to be affordable for all its members, including the poorest ones, and to be reinterpreted for future use. Her solution was to focus on three colors, very simply, to symbolize the movement's values. They were purple to represent dignity, green for hope, and white for purity. Sylvia dispatched detailed instructions to all WSPU members, suggesting that if necessary, they could make their color-coded accessories from ribbons, scraps of fabric, uh, from old clothes, or even sheet uh, bedding material. Impeccably conceived, planned, and executed, the color strategy proved so effective that Sylvia was then later asked to design all the WSPU future events. And among other visual signifiers that they introduced was a dress code specified for public, uh, for public events, and namely, all white clothing. They had insisted from the start that the WSPU would have far greater impact on public opinion if its members played on stereotypical perceptions of femininity by being neatly dressed all in white, a symbol of innocence, vulnerability, and respectability. And she, they were right. And as this po portrait of Charlotte Marsh from 1910 demonstrates, white also had the maximum visual impact in press images of marches and rallies. And demure white Victorian dresses acted as camouflage by helping the suffragettes to slip un in unobtrusively into political meetings and public spaces in order to stage their protests. They then would extract their purple and their green and don them across their white dresses before going on to such exceptionally demonstrative acts as smashing windows or vandalizing the roofs of meeting halls and heckling politicians, as Marsh did in, in this image from Birmingham in 1909. Unfortunately, that act led to her arrest, during which time she went on a hung hunger strike and suffered terribly for it. So we owe her a great deal today for the pain that she, and suffering that she endured. But color and textile have been used, obviously, far more recently in political protest. From the outrage that followed the then president-elect Donald Trump's toxic and aggressively sexist admission to grabbing him by the pussy came the most visually effective and internationally recognized symbol of protest this century, the pink pussy hat. 
the vision of co-founders Krista Sue and Jane Zweiman and launched in advance of the Women's March on Washington in January 2017, the project encouraged hundreds of thousands of people to download a rudimentary open source pattern to knit a pink hat. Drawing on the broad history of knitting as a tool for non-violent political activism, or craftivism, as Betsy Greer coined it in the early 2000s, Sue and Zweiman believed that the process of making, sharing, and wearing a hat would be, dem would be a demonstration of solidarity for women's rights and political resistance. Yet the sea of pink marching of, on cities around the world was much more than just a moment. It became a movement in its own right. Never before had craftivism been witnessed on this scale. And by harnessing the power of social media, the project spread like pink wildfire fire across continents. I mean, really, the simplicity of its idea just completely belies its audacious provocation. Much like the previous examples, Annie Albers, shown here in the image, was by necessity a pioneering female force. When she arrived at the German Bauhaus School of Art and Design in 1922, she was a gifted, spirited 23-year-old who had her heart set on studying metalwork. And why not? After all, in its opening manifesto, the founding director of the, of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius, promised to welcome everybody, regardless of age or sex, and to, and to break the traditional boundaries between the arts. As one of the first schools to actively pursue female students, in its first term alone, women outnumbered the male students 84 to 79. Yet when Albers and her fellow female students were accepted, most were dispatched to the weaving workshop, where they were forced to study what was then considered the feminine subjects. But why then was such a supposedly progressive school so mis misogynistic? that they were marginalized owes as much to the school's brief existence, 14 years between 19, sorry, can you take that? Between 1919 and 1933, as it does to the rise and horrific consequences of the Nazi movement and its view of anything modern as degenerate. I'm sorry, I'm not touching it and you're moving forward. Can you please take it back? Okay, I'll carry on. Uh, if you could get it to the image, please, of the black and white image of Annie Albers sitting at the loom, that would be great. The underlying truth is, however, the Bauhaus never was the, ha the haven of equality that Gropius initially espoused. Despite the rhetoric, the school's form did not follow its original stated function. The Bauhaus had progressive aspirations, but the men in charge represented the prevailing societal attitudes of the time. It was simply a step too far to bring equality across the board. Concerned that the number of female students would damage the school's credibility, Gropius later placed a limit on the female, female applicant quotas and directed the increasingly uh, reduced few towards less challenging subjects. <coughs> it was a prejudice that would, be, that would have significant impact. As appalling as these stories are to hear today, Albers created some of the most avant-garde textiles of her time. Her persistent determination pushed the finite, ba finite boundaries of the loom, manipulating the process, technique, and limitations of her tools. Searching for a new language in textile design, she created groundbreaking juxtapositions of natural yarns with man-made fibers and materials, including cellophane, fiberglass, and metal. Looking to construct a functional relationship between textiles and architecture, thank you, she explored, oh, now I can try, yeah. Uh, she explored fi woven fibers ability to absorb sound and reflect light. These might be commonplace now, but very innovative for their time. Unfortunately, with mounting concerns for their own welfare in an increasingly anti-Semitic environment, Annie and her husband Joseph emigrated to the United States in 1933. While for many years, Annie, like most wives, was considered as Mrs. Joseph Albers, in 1949, MoMA in New York celebrated her as one of the most imaginative and daring of modern weavers working in the United States. They gave her a solo exhibition of her work, the museum's first ever exhibition dedicated to a textile artist. 
It was a momentous occasion for both Albers and Monmouth, and it was to cement Albers, Annie Albers' international reputation. Another fiber art piece, The Dinner Party by American-born Judy Chicago from 1979. When it first debuted at the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco, it was denounced as a work of kitsch, <coughs> vilified as pornographic, and hailed as a feminist tour de force. Chicago's The Dinner Party still manages to stir up controversy and demand the spotlight, even almost four decades after the work was first unveiled. It took nearly five years to produce the massive rectangular, uh, tri sorry, triangular banquet table, which is 48 feet long on each side with 39 bespoke place settings for mythical and historical famous women, including Eleanor of Aquitaine, Empress Theodore of Byzantium, Virginia Woolf, and Georgia O'Keeffe. It required the assistance of some 400 volunteers, many of whom specialized in art forms that were rarely acknowledged in the contemporary art world, such as china painting and needlework. And as Chicago's research, Judy Chicago's research and skills developed to the scope of her installation, Additions included an open floor uh, upon which 999 additional women's names were, were inscribed, cutlery, chalices, chairs, and banners. Each place setting, as you can see here, uh, had a lavishly embroidered table mat with the name of the, the woman being celebrated, mm -hmm. and a porcelain plate that doubled as an abstract portrait of these real or mythical women. High decoration, artistic referencing, female genitalia, it was all there. In fact, Chicago had come to believe that the central core imagery, which celebrated feminine eroticism and fertility, could be used to challenge patriarchal constructions of women. For Chicago, there existed an irreducible difference between men and women, and that difference being their genitals. She had already established herself as a progenitor of feminist art, and like many of her peers, she was came to this out of pure frustration from the male-dominated art world of the 1960s, and of course the decades and centuries before that. Uh, but alongside this, she also established pioneering feminist art ed education, both in uh, Fresno State College and then also at the Women's Building and the Feminist Studio Workshops in Los Angeles, where not only did she bring artists together, but train them to channel their experiences as women into their art and to search out the often overlooked female uh, predecessors for inspiration. Having so being, having had the dinner party rejected, having had it critically dismissed, it's being used as political grandstanding, it's now actually considered a key piece of contemporary art and has a permanent installation in a dedicated space at the uh, feminist, uh, Sackler Center for Feminist Art in, in Brooklyn. They're not directly related to textile production, but definitely related to feminist protests through clothing was the iconic and mythical image of the bra burning feminist. Some 50 years ago, a protest against Miss America, against a Miss America beauty pageant in New Jersey, saw a group of women hurling mops, lipsticks, and high heels into the freedom trash can. The idea was to symbolically throw away things that had oppressed women, and passers-by were invited to join in. And one said passerby decided to strip off her bra from underneath her t-shirt and throw it in the can. It was a gesture that made headlines around the world, securing the protesters um, a place in history. But depending on which story you read, the bin did catch light, but not intentionally, and was quickly extinguished. But what managed to stick in the public consciousness about the protest was not necessarily the point of their protest, but the image of the bra-burning feminist something that paradoxically never actually happened. Perhaps more blatant and aggressive was the 1990s riot girl movement, a group of female music musicians from West Coast America who were fueled by the anger and misogyny in national news stories and at a local level within the music scene itself. Riot girl sought to frame femini feminist issues through punk rock lenses sparking a third wave of feminism with bands such as Heaven to Betsy, Bratmobile, and Bikini um, Kill. These bands called for a revolution girl style, and they held regular meetings and national conferences, similar to the feminist discussion and support groups of the 60s and 70s. Their forums allowed women to meet and to dis 
to discuss music, but as well as their experiences and experiences of sexism, body image and identity. Riot Girls rallied against commercial capitalist culture and mainstream standards of beauty and expected female behavior. And their relationship with clothing and self-image is, is one that disassociated political passivity from engagement with style. It, I mean, it would be reductive to talk about Riot Girls' relationship to fashion in terms of look. However, in their own DIY zines, which were how the girls connected by photocopying and mailing these lo-fi publications across the country and by handing them out at gigs, many Riot Girls talked about their feelings towards clothes. They discussed them in the first-person narrative and exposed, comments, uh, exposed the comments people had made about what they should and shouldn't be wearing. Um, and in this sense, riot, the Riot Girls intellectualized and even weaponized fashion in their work. Kathleen Han Hanna. There we go. Uh, who was the poster girl for the movement and the front woman of Bikini Girl at uh, Bikini Kill, sorry, in the Tigre, uh, tapped fashion for amplification. On stage, as you could see, she would often wear nothing but a bra top with the word slut written across her torso. Uh, but in a 2013 interview in L. Kath, uh, Hannah explained one costume in particular, the one on your right, in which she's wearing a t-shirt dress, wearing a photograph of a speedo-clad, oiled-up man. It's actually a nighty, and it's a Chippendale dancer's uh, body on the front and also on the back. And Hannah describes it as being like the man that lives inside of her. She was playing with the idea of gender, that no one is female or male, that we have so many different traits, and that, in her words, it's just a lie that these certain traits are male and these certain traits are female. So it was like, this is my dude, this is the dude within me. Clothes and fashion have obviously played a large part in constructing notions of gender throughout history, but the work of Gabrielle Maher sets out to deconstruct the ways in which clothing is used to compose and structure our genders. I'll say that again, sorry. It's normally used to construct notions, but Gabrielle deconstructs these notions. Gabriel makes, uh, sorry, Gabrielle, I should explain, uh, uses gender non-binary pronouns. Uh, they, them, theirs, so this is why I will refer to them as they. Uh, they created a, a series of garments that explores the construction of gender through movement by designing uh, a series of garments and then filming these movements in action. As such, these garments uh, allude to how we read the body, how we divide and dissect it, using visual clues to establish gender meaning. And as, as they, as Gabrielle says, when we decide about someone, we do it very quickly. Things like gender, we conclude in a millisecond. But to me, it doesn't make sense to assume, to assume anymore. Why assume gender through a body? And why is it so important to categorize anyway? It is always this or that, always a binary. And then those binaries are reinforced and legitimized in the media. My goal was to escape from that dynamic. As the starting point, Maha investigated the way differently gendered bodies sit, exploring the position itself, the space taken up by the position, and the object and garment which controls how the, the person sits. As, as Maha went on to say, I wanted to change the silhouette of the body. So they created this uh, mark of claimed space, which is the physically white stitched part in the garment, which perhaps this image doesn't show as well as the last. Um, but the body is then directed into positions which have gendered meaning. And for Maha, it was an, a chance to reduce the gendering of these positions and then reveal them as learnt behaviour, which is something I think you know, was raised in the questions earlier, who thinks that gender is a social construct. It's a learnt behaviour. Now, obviously, this focus on, uh, this focuses on women, uh, but it's not the only marginalised group that, we're te that textile and dress has been used to address. This is perhaps a slightly light-hearted in, uh, inclusion, um, but not only was Black Panther cost box office gold, but it was a design blockbuster on every single level, from architecture to fashion, vehicles, and jewellery. 
and all of which portray a future of Africa full of vibrant and diverse tribal references and untouched by the colonial hand. Ruth Carter, who was responsible for all the costume and set design, had studied the garments uh, of, uh, uh, of traditional clothing from different parts of Africa and combined them with 3D printing and other advanced digital fabrication techniques to devise a singular costume for each character and each community. It was a true tour de force that went beyond any vision of an atrofuturistic homage. And the design team, who were predominantly female and black, were one of the first female black design groups to be acknowledged not only by the international movie industry, but also now increasingly so in exhibitions in major institutions which are celebrating the work. Though as that point highlights them being one of the first, design has not only been, design has been accused as being a man's world, but now I think perhaps we should be acknowledging that it's a white man's world. Another issue that has been taboo in a museum context until very recently is that of menstruation. The exhibition Broken Nature, curated by Paola Antonelli, currently in Milan, has one of its exhibits, the Thinks Period Proof Pants. While its inclusion in the exhibition focuses more on how these waterproof pants offer an alternative to disposable sanitary products how we inter and how we interact with the environment as a result, the pants, regardless of the ich factor, are a perfect example of how women have taken an everyday object and redesigned them through lateral thinking to solve a universal problem. The underwear and the accompanying ads, discussion and debate normalize not only menstruation, but experiences specific to being a woman that have traditionally been coated in a whole lot of taboo. Who actually came up with the idea first for these waterproof pants is a hotly contested subject. The most of the contenders are women, and uh, the pants themselves address issues way beyond that of just menstruation, such as uh, allergy to traditional sanitary products, toxic shock, shock syndrome, pelvic floor weaknesses, and the pain of a heavy flow each month that traditional products alone just don't address. Catherine Hamlet, I'm glad she was mentioned earlier. She is a true um, hero of mine. She caused quite a stir. She's a British designer. She caused quite a stir in the 1980s with her uh, impactful political slogans in bold type. During a decade of unbridled consumerism, Hamlet took the rhetoric of advertising and slyly refashioned it for her liberal political causes. Her most famous moment, as witnessed in this photograph, took place upon being invited to a reception at the heart of British political life, number 10 Downing Street, the residence of the Prime Minister. Sneaking a t-shirt in under her coat, she took the then British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher's hand, and uh, shaking it whilst wearing this 58% don't want Pershing. It was a statement reiterating the public opposition to the Prime Minister, granting the US permission to station nuclear missiles on British soil. The image ended up on the front cover of newspapers, bringing widespread attention to the campaign for nuclear disarmament. And according to Whitehall legend, Whitehall being the seat of government in, in Britain, it was one of the few times that ministers ever saw Margaret Thatcher, otherwise known as the Iron Lady, visibly rattled. But with the emergence of fourth wave feminism in the 2010s, the t-shirt as political tool has undergone a revival. Reflected in a 2014 ubiquitous, this is what a feminist looks like t-shirt. Produced as a collaboration between Elle and a British high street chain store called Whistles, it foreshadowed the increasingly murky waters of commodity feminism. It later emerged that these t-shirts, as this picture clearly shows, were being manufactured in Mauritian sweatshops by women earning less than 50 cents an hour. A more complicated issue has been witnessed by the absorption, absorption of political slogan tea into the luxury market. Is the political sentiment undermined by the price tag attached to it? For uh, Maria Chira's inaugural collection for Dior, which is that one, the bottom right on your side, 
she opened with this powerful statement, quoting Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's now seminal We Should All Be Feminists essay on a t-shirt. But the catch, it, was, it cost 490 pounds, what's that, about 400 euros, which didn't go down too well in social media, so the house had to announce that a proportion of the proceeds would go to uh, Rihanna's Clara Lionel Foundation, giving their money away. But then we have also Chanel and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I've completely forgotten who the person on the left, on, on your left is. But all of these brands cashing in, as we say, on the consumability of feminism. So what does that say about our future? Where do we go from here? Uh, there was a report established by the American analytical firm called McKinsey, which I highly recommend that those of you interested in this subject look up. It was called The Glass Catwalk, and it was predominantly looking at American uh, companies and assessing the gender polarity, the gender equity, the gender binarity, binalities within their industries. And unfortunately, a lot of work still has to happen. I mean, it shouldn't just be about equal representation because that just smacks of contrived uh, number fixing. But what we would n really need to see is a lot more respect towards women in the industry. And whichever industry it is, I think the best way for that, for that to happen is for women to actually start supporting each other. I think for a long time, women, unfortunately, have been forced to as absorb this male persona of being macho and fighting for their role. And in actual fact, I think women are very good at working together and supporting each other to be able to help move the conversation forward. Because quite honestly, this can't be the last sentence, but it is going to be mine for tonight. So thank you very much. Sellers, thank you so much. Can I invite you for a second here? Um, so there will be room for more questions later tonight. Start by asking my own. Um, so you, your book has been published in 2018 and of course the last years there has been a lot uh, happening with the hashtag MeToo movement of course. Um, there has been a lot of noise there's an illustration of that. Um, we can buy socks in weekday now with a uh, feminist on it or clitoris on it. I thought of buying some, but I couldn't find them. Um, but you already talked about the commodity feminism, for example. But is there actually something happening in the fashion industry? Do you feel there is actually something happening or is it just on the surface? Is it only on socks? T-shirts. Well, I think you have to remember that the fashion industry is a multi, multi million euro, pound, dollar, whichever currency we want to talk about, industry. It's a business and they have to design things that sell and those images sell. Um, so yes, I think that is glib mm -hmm. uh, referencing. Uh, and. But then on the other hand, you have Dior having appointed their first ever female director, ever. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think actually the fashion industry now is much more biased than it probably was when it started in the early 20th century. You have to remember that clothes were always made with all <laughs> clothes. You had a tailor and you had a dressmaker. And I'm sure, you know, there were equal representation of tailors that they were dressmakers and men went to one and women went to the other. It was only with the commodi commodification, whatever, of the industry uh, that, that this sort of big billion dollar scenario started to, to push the choices and the decisions that were being made. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know so much about the fashion industry. What do you mean exactly by the commodifying of the commodified industry? Okay, so when you look at the big companies that mm -hmm. own all the major fashion houses, there's mm -hmm. six that own pretty much every single luxury goods brand that exists all around the world. And they're, they're the ones that are calling the shots. They're the ones that are making all these decisions. I mean, Chanel is owned by Chanel Inc, you know, they, I think, or are they PPR? Somebody correct me. Um, 
they're one of the few that probably can. <coughs> Karl Lagerfeld, rest in peace, is one of the few that could have probably called his own shots. But so many other decisions that are being made and all these other smaller fashion brands that are owned by Arnaud, LVMH, PPR, etc., etc., have to meet, meet targets. Mm -hmm. And so decisions are being made that aren't supportive of the designers that are working in the companies. And I think that is the problem that has to be solved first, that they have to respect the designer, and then that from that will become you know, a much more safe place, a much more encouraging place, a much more interesting place to work. Mm -hmm. it, it, all it right now is seeking is profit, regardless of the gender of who's making it. So the idea that, that fashion is dictated or no, let's say, let's say that it emerges from the idea of a few very creative people is maybe a little bit naive. Yes. Okay. It very, is very, very naive. It's ka-ching, ka -ching. Okay. So, and um, are people more aware of that, you think? Or is it also... No. I don't know. <laughs> no, I no, it's I... the first time I, I'm hearing of this, for example. Um, well, I, I, as, as I said, I highly recommend reading the McKinsey's Glass Catwalk report because it very clearly it lists all the statistics that show just exactly where the money's coming from, how it's, you know, what percentage of uh, gender e equity there are in these businesses and whether it even matters to them. And for a large part, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not part of their program to worry about things like that. It is just simply the profit margin at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just disrespect for the people that are in the industry. And that's, that's what I think needs to change. Yes. And I, there are grassroots, but... Mm -hmm. For example, the two other speakers who you'll hear tonight, I think they're fiercely independent uh, designers. Um, do you see something happening there, not necessarily in the, let's say, in the, not in the, in the upper layer, but maybe in the layer just below? Is there something happening there in the, in the fashion industry, an image of beauty that might be changing as well? I would put it to the fellow speakers, do you believe that you're part of the fashion industry? I don't know. Maybe in even asking that, I'm suggesting, <laughs> yes. Somebody says yes? Well, then I, I think you should answer that question, not me. I mean, I come at it from a commentator, not a manufacturer or producer of work. Did you register with you just after dinner? And you said that it's impossible to pinpoint in the art history or the history of anything, this leading you to this. Would you agree with that? Is that way that I would not define myself as a fashion designer? I'm, I create. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because it came from a very deep dissatisfaction of buying things I didn't know of. I don't know how they're made, who made them. Like I believe that all inanimate things have energy the way biological components have. So I'm carrying an energy that I have no idea what. Mm -hmm. And the prints, the colors, the shapes. First of all, I didn't want to look like everybody else around me. Second, I just, I'm very peculiar with prints, let's put it this way. I didn't like anything out there. So I like the idea of uh, carrying my worldview on me, so I have to make it. Yes. But do I define myself as part of the fashion system? No. Okay. Not, I mean, maybe one day I don't limit myself. I have an interesting topic for discussion when the three of us, well, the four of us and the three of you will be on stage later. Um, but let's say that Flora said, yes, I am part of the fashion industry, and Bina said, no, I'm not actually part of the fashion industry. So let's talk about that later. <coughs> so I've said one thing, but as the exhibition Wonder Woman shows, it, there are lots of women working in the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. They're just not necessarily getting to the top of the industry's senior level you know, strata. And that's for all the reasons that I think we've already discussed today. And it's not changing so far. What? Well, in a very short amount of time. I only wrote the book last year. <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So if you would rewrite your book today, would you change anything? Are there topics that you haven't? Oh, there'd just be more people. I mean, there's, it's constrained by the nature of it being a publication with a beginning and end. And mm -hmm. there are so many more examples to, to use. Yes. Um, and how I chose the people that I that are in the book, 
uh, um, was to highlight particular, use their stories as a case study to explain the issues of collaboration and um, assigning credit in collaboration, or the general you know, patriarchy of the early 20th century, or the uh, bias of design history in focusing on industrial process as opposed to more handmade, hand laboured product, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there'd just be more. I mean, there's so many more. Yes, more examples. Yeah. Of, um, and what can we, what do you think um, we could do to change the system? I think if I'm, if I'm correct, you said maybe the question of quota could um, come up. And um, you mentioned in your talk something that, that uh, in the Bauhaus people were suffering under, that, the, that there was the idea that the level will drop if we introduce more women. I think it's a similar problem um, or it's a similar issue that is raised when we talk about quota. Oh no, our standards will drop. Is it something... Um, yeah, what do you think are possible solutions? Do you see there are possible solutions? And um, is quota a possible solution for you? Um, I personally don't think that you should have equal representation in the workforce just to be able to achieve a number. I think it ne needs to be based on merit. Mm -hmm. And uh, this conversation came up earlier um, about competitions and how blind competitions enable uh, you know, not sending in an application without having to say your gender, your race, your location, yes. enables the work to be judged on its merit and it removes a lot of the um, preconceived stereotype responses that might produce it. But for women, and I have to really clarify, for women who identify as cis female, I think it's, and who choose to have family or to, you know, take on responsibilities outside of the workplace. I think that an environment that encourages that kind of lifestyle, so more flexible working hours, safe, uh, safe workspaces, childcare if that's appropriate, um, and bloody paying people the mm -hmm. same amount of money as their male colleagues are receiving, so that they they feel that their efforts and energies are being rewarded. And I think that, what is it, there's the statement that most women actually end up working a four-day week because one of those days, they're not getting paid for it in comparison to their male colleagues. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the 20-80 ratio, that, you know, women get paid 20% less generally than most men. So Monday to Thursday, I'm working for pay, but Friday I'm working and I'm not getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's across every industry. It's quite standard. I think we have time for one question, but I might ask a question myself. So I already told I'm reaching the 35, uh, well, I know I'm already 35. So, but according to all these numbers I read, um, my pay will drop drastically in the coming 10 years um, because I uh, identify as female and I might want to have a family. What advice would you have for me? <laughs> um, what can we do? Oh, uh, gosh. I, I, I can say it again, but I think we need to encourage better working environments to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. um, and if that needs to be become systemic at government level and lobbying, I mean, make it make it that. But I think you need to fight for your place to be able to earn the same money that you're earning right now. Mm -hmm. Not be silent about it and. Um, you know, carry on, just do it. Do we have a question from the audience? Not so far, then is there a hand? <coughs> then we'll keep your questions for after the discussion because I will look at Vida. You have been drawing. Can you talk yes, us through it? Yes, I, I can. I'll try to talk. Uh, so we had a quota bustling some women and some men <laughs> together. Yes. It usually sounds like that, but it isn't that similar in uh, practice. Then we had uh, the, uh, something abstract about uh, doing your own practice and uh, your view on the world, and reaching to a book. Was, uh, I was very high when I did this. No, it's not true. Uh, so the fashion industry is uh, all about money, I understood. Something I think that a lot of industry suffer from, so 
the, okay. Then the feminist T-shirt held up by the leaders. <laughs> the homo, yeah, homo, the female Rio Donsalis, uh, like uh, Da Vinci, uh, the reimagination of the, the, the human. Uh, the male-dominated art scenes, uh, very difficult. Uh, then I like this one, uh, uh, the, the, the Bauhaus scene. I, I, I was taught about it in, uh, in uh, art school and I didn't know uh, this fact, so thank you so much. Uh, the, the, I, I forgot her name already. Annie Albus. Annie Albus. Okay, beautiful. Here is she, here is she um, weaving her way on top of the world. Uh, the female force, the suffragettes, and the, the pussy head. I like this connection between the two. Uh, the, the vote for women, design for women, designed by women, mm -hmm. suffragette style, suffragette city. Uh, so we had uh, the, the male, pers the cis male perspective. Oh, but we're very feminist. Look at all our bronze naked ladies. <laughs> it's uh, very recognizable in the art world. Uh, name one designer, Coco, not Coco Chanel. Okay. Uh, yeah, now we are with the female voices in the art world. Thank you so much, females. Thank you, Vida. Thank you, Libby, again. Um,